it's time again to bring our blessing, to bring a blessing to our God. What mercy he has shown, causing us to be born again. Born into a living hope, because our Christ is raised. Born into a family. Born into a future. Treasure endless and unfading, held in heaven's hands, hands that guard our hearts, hearts that trust in God, convinced that he will save us, confident he will show himself. We stand now rejoicing even in the trial. Our fire-tested faith grows hot, bringing glory to our God. We have never seen Him, and still we love Him. We don't see Him now, and still we rejoice. Joy without words. Joy full of glory. We are being saved, have been saved, will be saved. We bring a blessing now to the Father of our Savior, our one and living hope. Amen. Buenos dias. Good morning. How are you doing today? Well, um, I'm just excited to share today because we are in a series that we're talking about First Peter. And, um, you know, we are going to be spending uh, the great majority of our time in uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 1. So if you have your Bible, get ready for that. But we're going to talk about the word inheritance. Can you say inheritance? And, and really, it's going to be what we're going to be talking about today, all inheritance, inheritance, inheritance. And, and as I was looking at the word inheritance, I had to Google it. And if you Google it, you find interesting stuff. Have you been there when you start like, looking stuff like that? Like if you get sick, you go to WebMD and you're like, holy cow. I'm, anyway, it just gets scary, right? So I Google about inheritance and I found some of the craziest inheritance that people have ever gotten. And you are going to have the pleasure to listen to them. All right. So the first one is Levi jeans. Those were really cool in the 80s. I still remember. And now they came back and they're back again and whatever. Okay. So this one, inheritance. An Arizona, a guy from Arizona discovered that his grandpa left him some brand new 124-year-old Levi's never used. Imagine that. And he was very surprised about it. And Levi's, the company, reached out to them. And you know how much they wanted to pay for those jeans? $50,000. And guess what he said? No. It's like, come on, guys. You know, another one. This is about a lady called uh, Velma. And she left $3.5 million state for her family. And I guess she did not have a really good relationship with her daughters, that um, she only left them a couple pieces of silver, that they were worth a little bit. But in order for them to get the $3.5 million, she, had, she told them that they had to read all the diaries that she had left, and the daughters were going to be quizzed on specific questions about her life to know if she, they really read the stuff and knew her family. Imagine that. I would be like, eh, no, keep the money. Not really. I would probably read it, you know? <laughs> Another one, a guy from Vermont. He was a janitor from a gas, you know, working at a gas station as an attendant there. He lived very frugal. He didn't spend much money. When he passed away, they discovered he had an eight million state which he left to his hometown library 
and also to a hospital in his hometown. Imagine that. So now be nice to the people on gas stations. You never know. You know, they might leave you, give you some money. I don't know. Another one. <clears throat> this is a guy from um, Portugal. His name is Luis Carlos de Noronha Cabral Camara. Imagine that. <laughs> Probably didn't like him because of his name. Um, anyway, so this was in the 80s when he was going to pass away. Uh, he did not actually get along with his family. So really close to for him to pass away, he went into a phone book. If you know what a phone book is, there used to be really cool a few years ago. Now you just look your phone. And she picked, uh, he picked randomly 70 names to leave his money. And random people got a call and they got the money. What an inheritance. Imagine that. So talk to those telemarketers, guys. It might pay off. It might be this guy calling you say, hey, I have a thousand dollars or I can forgive your uh, school loans. It's probably you get that. You know what I mean? And this is the last one. I say for uh, last because it's really sweet. So a comedian called Jack Benny in 1970s, um, he ready to pass away, and he didn't. He would live very simple life, and he put it in his will that he was gonna leave. Uh, he wanted to make sure that his wife, after he passed, she received a red rose every single day of her life until she passed away. Oh, Renee would have been like, just give me the money. <laughs> it's true, but yes. I can imagine like Renee opening the door is like, give me a rose, come on. <laughs> anyway, just a joke anyway. So guys, do you know, now in more of a serious note, do you know that you and I, we have access to an inheritance? And that's what actually Peter is going to talk about today to us. And he wants us to have that inheritance. He wants us to receive it. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's just take a moment and pray. You know, this is really just center yourself and allow God to speak to you. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here, Father. Thank you for laughter. Thank you for joy. But Lord, we pray, Father, that truly there will be a transformation in our lives, Lord. Encourage us, challenge us, Lord Jesus. Speak hope to us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Listen to what it says in here. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, Peter one of the closest friends to Jesus when he was on earth, he's talking to these churches, this letter that was passed around into the different churches in the Turkey area, and he's telling them about this inheritance. And he use, is using this word called a living hope. Hear it. It's not something that is dead. It's something that is living. It's a hope. But in order, as we read, in order for someone to receive an inheritance... What does it need to happen? Someone needs to die. Hear that. In order for us to receive an inheritance, someone needs to die. And here is saying that the person that died was Jesus. And it was not only a death, but actually it's a resurrection. And that actually is key, guys, because we can talk about so many things about, well, this person died for this, this person died for that. But here saying that Jesus Christ rose from the dead is huge. It's a living hope that you and I have. And he, that's what Peter starts talking about this. So now, I start thinking about this concept of, you know, someone dying and having to pay for this inheritance. And I, I was talking to a, a friend not long ago, and they were telling me about, you know, this person was ready to retire and was explaining to me all this challenges and business that he was doing and he was saying you know I've worked really hard and you know I'm so thankful God has prospered me and I was like man I can see it this is awesome and then suddenly he stops me he said you know what yeah it's been great but it was not me actually my grandpa was the one who started all this and 
When all this started with my grandpa, he made a lot of sacrifices. And when he passed away, then my dad had to make the choice to receive this inheritance. And he's not, you know, and then now my dad, when he was ready to pass, he, I, he's not my friend, was saying, I had to make the choice if I was going to receive that inheritance or not. You know, and I've worked really hard, but someone died to receive, in order for them to receive that, someone had to die. And now here, Peter is talking about this. It's a living hope. It's beyond that. It's so much bigger than that. Let's continue to verse 4. Listen to this about this inheritance. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Guys, it's telling, you that, telling us that this inheritance has some characteristics that are very important for us to know. You know, it's saying here that this is imperishable. It does not go bad. Like, guys, um, the milk in my fridge a couple of days ago, um, I opened it and I was like, it still looks good. It smells a little fishy, but let's give it a try. It was bad, guys. It goes bad. You know, saying that this inheritance doesn't have that. The inheritance, it doesn't go that. It says, you know, it's undefiled. It means that it doesn't get corrupted. Those that grew up in the 90s that had a computer, do you ever have Windows 95 on your computer? Do you ever have a virus on it? You had to, like, lose everything. It was terrible. Those with a smartphone, have you ever had that you didn't have it backed up on the cloud because you don't want to pay the monthly fee? Guess what happens when it gets something? It gets gone. You know, it's saying here, this inheritance doesn't have that problem. It doesn't get corrupted. And it's unfading. It doesn't grow old. Like the paint on my 2003 Honda Pilot that looks a little bit unfaded. It's not like that, guys. It looks nice. It's good. And says, in store in heaven. Means that it's safer than any place that you can imagine. The Pentagon or any safe place that you might have. It's saying that this inheritance is in a good place. But more than anything, it is alive for you and I. Let's go to verse 5. It says, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, hear this. This is hard, guys. You have been grieved by various trials. Guys, Peter is acknowledging that people that follow Jesus, that want this living hope, are going to face difficulties. Can you relate? I mean, I can relate 100% with this, guys. And, and I just start thinking, these guys, most likely, they were in the place where they grew up. They were probably in a place, in a culture where they could speak the same language, where they had certain traditions. But because they chose to follow Jesus, suddenly they were living differently. They were seeing and doing things that did not make sense. And they were doing it because of Christ. And, you know, here Peter is saying, you know what? You have been grieved by various trials and circumstances. And to me, when I hear this, it gives me hope. Because it makes me think that I am not alone. Those, you know, I'm not alone. There are people before me that they were doing this. They were trying to live for God. I start imagining, you know, what will happen? That, uh, you know, maybe that youth and kids during that time, that maybe they were in the situations when they felt that they did not fit 100% with what other people the same age were doing in their community. Maybe because they were compassionate. Maybe because uh, they didn't speak like the other kids were speaking or the young people there. They stand up for the weak. They were generous. I imagine also maybe the people that were working on the fields during that time and they were doing other stuff that maybe when they had their first produce and, you know, they were there and their neighbor reached out to them and was like, hey, what are you doing with this? And he's like, hey, my first fruit is for God. And they're like, you're crazy. Why are you doing that? Or maybe facing persecution in their businesses and beyond. 
because they did not worship the idols and the things that were there at that world in that time and season. So I hope that just like for me, it encourages you that when we are trying to live this living hope, that it's going to cost us something, but that is worth it. It's really worth it. And I'm just going to ask you this. Is your faith costing you something? Because if it's not, you might need to do some soul searching. Really, hear me this. Is your, it really, is your faith costing you something? Because this is what it's saying in here. Those guys, it was costing them something. Let's go to verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I have written down here, I need to ask you, do you really want me to tell you what I'm thinking that I'm going to tell you? You're not going to like it. <laughs> do you really want me to say it? Are you sure? I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to say goodbye to you when I'm there, and I want to make sure we say goodbye and you're not mad at me, okay? You know, God is more concerned about you being holy than actually you being happy. Do you want me to say it one more time? God is more concerned about you being holy than being happy. And I don't like it either. You know, uh, I mean, we were, uh, we were at men's group on Wednesday. If you were there Wednesday night, we were hanging out there, some of the guys. And we were talking about, you know, with Francis Chan, he was saying this. And we were talking about the book. We we're studying the book of James. And it was that. And all of us we were like, yeah, we don't like this. It's terrible. You know, I want to be happy. But God is not as concerned about that. He's more concerned for you and I to be holy. It means that we're going to be uncomfortable our time. You know, and he makes the, the, the comparison that it's just like gold. When gold, you want it to be pure, the best gold needs to go through fire. In order to remove impurities and things that are not good. Do I like fire? No. Except for my steak, yes. But not fire when it's difficult, when it's not. But I don't like it. But this pain can lead us to grow closer to God and also help others grow closer to God. You know, at times, guys, in my ideal world, I would love for, you know, people to be like, oh, man, Rod is so good at this or he's good at that. Uh, you know, my life is great. I have it all together. But then I start realizing that if people saw that in me, then they will say, well, the reason that Rod follows God is because he's a pastor, because he has it all together, because he has a great marriage, which we love each other, but at times it's hard, right? And we just say, well, they have beautiful kids. We do, but is it easy at times? No, it's not. Sometimes it's hard to be a dad and, you know, and beyond. But I can realize that God, and also for all of us, we relate more with the difficulties when we go through difficult times, guys. You know, that God uses my pain, my failures, my weaknesses to bring healing to others. That in the same way that God is working in my life, He can work in your life. And that's the way it works. Sometimes you relate more with people that are going through tough stuff than actually when people are like, well, they have a great job. Yeah, well, if they're, you know, if I look like this guy, I mean, all built up, then I probably, you know, I don't have as many problems. You know what? No, you relate with people that are in the same situations. I don't like it, but pain has a purpose. And that's actually what we're talking about here also, about this inheritance with this living hope is going to come pain. Let's go to verse 8. It says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Guys, Peter is saying this. Saying, you guys that are listening right now to this letter, you actually never saw Jesus, but you still believe. You know, and, and Peter is saying this because 
You know, he was one of the apostles. He spent three years of his life approximately with Jesus all the time, hanging out with him, you know, going in, you know, valleys and hills, seeing people doing miracles and beyond. So Peter could say in first hand, say, yeah, I believe this because I saw him. But he's encouraging, saying, this guy's, you know what? You believe even though you did not see. And that's, for us, hopefully, speaks hope to you and I, guys. He said, you still love him. You still believe in him. You rejoice with joy. We don't need to read the diaries. We don't need to do this test in order for us to receive this inheritance like that crazy story that we just read at the beginning. We have access to that. That's what Jesus did for us. A living hope, guys. Guys, I was thinking about this because I think that maybe this is a crutch for a lot of us. Maybe for you in this season. That maybe, like, you actually, uh, you might think that this thing about inheritance, about, you know, heaven, about God having a bigger purpose is simply a fairy tale. And you're like, you know, I really want to do what God tells me to do. You know, I'm going to do all the things like I'm going to be, try to be a good person. I'm going to follow the rules. I'm going to honor this. I'm going to honor that. When I'm in the streets, if I see a piece of trash, I'm going to pick it up, put it in a trash can. You know, um, but when it comes to faith, hear me, trusting God, suddenly you turn like in the movie Elf, you turn in Elf's dad. Have you, do you remember that? Have you ever watched that movie, the movie Elf? You know, the, the dad of Elf. And, and if you don't know this, I'm going to explain you a little bit what happened in that movie. There is a moment when Christmas was dying. It was over. And there was this uh, chrysometer or clausometer or whatever. And then that what actually was making the, you know, Santa's sled to go and fly around to deliver the gifts. And it was dead because no one believed in Christmas. And there's, of course, the famous quote that says, the best way to spread Christmas cheer is? You've watched it too many times. I hope you read the Bible in the same way. <laughs> and there is this scene when that is happening, the Christmas spirit is really low. So then people start singing Christmas songs to spread the Christmas cheer and beyond. But one kid sees that Elf's dad is just only moving his mouth and not singing. And in other words, the son is like, Dad, you are not singing. You are faking it. In other words, you don't believe in it. You don't believe in this. And then, of course, he's like, Santa Claus is coming to die. You know, and then, the, you know, the clothesometer goes up and starts flying. And there was a great story. Everybody cry. Elf is happy. And... It had syrup, and it was amazing. But in all seriousness, do you believe? And if you don't believe yet, are you open to say, God, I'm open to believe. Show me. Help my own belief. And here Peter is saying to this church, you know, even though you did not see, you still believe. So now here is when I say this to you and I. Is how do you apply this? What do you do with this? How does this inheritance concept that Peter is talking about, the living hope, means to me? Being 100% honest with you, I cannot guarantee to you that you're going to have a great earthly inheritance. I cannot promise that to you. Trust me. I cannot promise to you you're going to have great health the rest of your life. I cannot promise you that your kids are going to listen better right now. Nope. But I can tell you this, that there is a heavenly inheritance that is available to you and I. Today, tomorrow, next week. But we have to believe. We have to trust God. And really, it doesn't matter if you are an empty nester, if you're trying to figure out what your life is going to look like, the, this part of your life, if you're a single parent, if you're a seasoned adult, 
If you're a junior higher or a high schooler, a college student or a husband or a wife, it boils down to this of what are you living for? That's how it actually looks like in our everyday life. What are you living for? Are you living for an inheritance that is going to fall and fade away? Or are you living for an inheritance that is going, not going to perish, guys? That will never perish. And guys, please don't get me wrong because I know when we start talking about stuff like that, then it gets a little bit weird. But I, I mean, honestly, guys, I like nice things too. I really ni like nice things. Like, uh, you know, I like things for them to work when you need them to work. So sometimes you have to spend money on doing those kind of things. But a few weeks ago, like for instance, Renee and I, we finally pulled the trigger and we bought some new couches. We've had the couches in our family room for about like 15 years. And honestly, we lost a couple friendships out of this couch. Like they came and they sat in there. They couldn't move for two weeks. They got back surgery and they sue us. We are still settling what's going to happen. I'm just messing with you. But they were really bad. And so finally we were like, we got, went to Ikea and then got that. It took us like 70 hours to put them together for all the pieces in Ikea. But once we sat down and we're like, this is nice. Oh my goodness, thank you. I forgot what it was like not to have back pain in my couch. So don't hear me. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have good or nice things, but really making sure that our focus is on things that really are beyond that about a month ago I had the, the blessing and opportunity to go to a friend's dad funeral and I don't know you guys but when you go to a funeral it gives you perspective it gives you perspective about what matters about how you want to be remembered about uh, what are the priorities that someone has in life And maybe at times things that makes you think things that for you matter so much, at that moment you're like, this is, doesn't matter anymore. And perhaps you do the same as me, but I started thinking, you know, how would people remember me if I was in my own funeral watching, what would say about me? And, you know, I start thinking, I would love for them to say, well, he was smart and funny, and he was like a Mexican hot man. I just added that as a funny note. But, but in all, truly, I will, when I was thinking about it, it's like, you know, I hope that in my funeral, that they will say, you know, he was a man of God. He was someone that helped and loved his family that those around him grow or grew closer to God. I mean, honestly, that's what I would love to. And if possible, that also I was a hot Mexican guy. <laughs> But now, guys, now here the question is, we have a choice today. We have a choice in this season of what actually our legacy is going to be. Our inheritance, not only ours, but those that are around us, our kids our grandkids you know um, maybe right now you this is the first time that you're you heard this message you know and I love what Romans 3:23 says that all of us have fallen short all of us have missed the mark but that there is a hope that is Jesus that died on the cross that us that's our hope guys so I really maybe right now that you're hearing this maybe you have to say okay I want to do that and I would like to pray at the end for that but maybe for some of us here maybe you are in another category where you actually need to think of like okay am I really spending the time that I need in things that are actually are eternal versus just some things that are of are going to fade away that are not going to matter So in just a minute, I want to ask Renee to come up and we're going to be taking communion to end this service together. But seriously, are you being consumed for things that are just simply going to perish? Or are you actually consumed by things that are going to be beyond? That is a living hope, what Peter spoke about. You know, maybe you might be able 
Some of us might be able, in faith, to leave a million dollars to our kids. And if you do, great. A lot of us, maybe we are not going to be able to leave a million dollars to our kids. But you know what? You can leave an eternal inheritance to them. I don't share this much, guys, but when I grew up in Mexico, 95% of the populations were not Christian. And then I used to be so mad because I was like, why am I some of the few Christians around where I was growing up? And then as I was asking my dad, he told me, he said, you know what? Your great grandma walking one time in downtown Mexico City, she heard worship and she went into this Methodist church that was there that was really odd. And because of this lady that I don't even know her name, my great grandma, suddenly the gospel came in my life. Imagine that. So I don't know you guys, maybe right now that you are here, like they're 11 and 12, perhaps because of you, your great grandkids are going to be impacted. So think about that, guys. Think about it. It matters. It matters. It matters. So let's just stand together. And I, I want to just take a moment. And, you know, perhaps for you, if this is your first time that you're hearing this, I would like just to pray for you. To say, you know what, I want to start this relationship with Jesus. But maybe for some of us right now here, maybe you need to start walking and acting like you have this living hope. You know, just like if I tell you right now that you are part of the royal family, you will act differently. If I'm telling you that you are like a big celebrity, a big YouTuber, if that it is, whatever, you kind of start acting like you are one. Like years ago, I met this famous soccer player in Mexico and I wanted to give him a hug and he wouldn't let me. Because he thought that he was a big shot, and he was. But I was like, come on, man. He's like, you know. So I just want to make sure that right now that we will start acting like we have this living hope. So let's just take a moment and pray, and then Renee will lead us into communion. Father, we thank you because we are not alone, Father. You really love us, Lord. And in this moment, I just pray, Father, for those of my friends that right now, for the first time, they are doing this prayer, Lord, of saying, you know what? I want to receive this gift. I want to receive it, and I want to say, I want my life to look differently. So I just want to pray for them right now that they will say yes. Lord, I also want to pray, Father, for my friends that right now, that you will give them the strength to start and continue living, Lord, as they really, as they are part of this living hope, Father. Not only in their families, in their, in their relationships, Lord, but, Father, that they will be able, Father, to, to really invest in things that matter the most, Lord Jesus. We love you and we thank you, Father, for just having Peter speak to us hope in this moment to us, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, and everybody say, amen. Amen. At this time, would you guys step out of your seats and grab some communion elements. There are tables up in the front. There are tables in the back. And just um, grab the bread and the juice and take it back to your seat, and we'll take it together in just a minute. So go ahead and open up the, the bread on the top there and just hold it out in front of you. And I want to just pray. Oh, Jesus, this, this piece of bread, this little wafer, Lord, this represents your body. And you said that this is my body that's broken for you. And you died. You physically died for us. You said we're worth it. You said that I want to give you an eternal inheritance. And so, Lord, right now as we take this bread, would you remind us of your body that was broken for us? Go ahead and take the bread. And then go ahead and just hold up that cup with the grape juice in it. There's nothing magical about this, yet what it represents is is the most important thing. Jesus said that this was his blood that was poured out for us. The blood that was dripping down his face, down his body, that he freely gave. No one took his life. He freely gave his life to cover our sin. 
And Jesus, we thank you. We, we do what you told us to do. We remember. We remember the cross, Lord. Forgive us of the times that we've taken it too lightly. We remember your blood. Thank you for shedding it on our behalf. Amen. Go ahead and take the juice and let's just worship together as we close. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation.
Jesus is going to get the victory today because there are people in here that are going to start their relationship with God and they are going to have a heavenly inheritance. Um, Tammy, would you pray for those people who are going to start their relationship with Jesus? Let me tell you something about Tammy. She believes in what God has in store for you. It's evident in her family. It's evident in her kids. And Jesus uses her. So G Tammy's going to pray for us, for those of us who um, are going to come back to God or start a relationship with God today. Oh, Lord, we, we're here humbly in your presence. And just the ones who want to come, the ones who need to come, the ones who have left and want to come back, the ones who don't know you, Lord, I just pray that in their being and, and that they can feel that they are loved, that you love them. Just reveal your presence to them and let them know that they are loved beyond measure. And um, just help us as a community to wrap our arms around those people also and come beside them and love them well. And just help them to know that you are the eternal inheritance, that they will live with you in glory, and there's nothing better than that. And just help us to be who we can be to show them that and just help them to know that because having that, that faith and that, that reality that you really do love us, sometimes it's so hard when we've been astray and we haven't done what we're supposed to do, but you don't care because you love us. And I just pray that over them. Amen. Thanks, Tammy. Um, if that was you, we want to celebrate with you. If you could tell someone here today, because um, your life is forever changed forever changed. Um, thank you guys for spending your Sunday with us today. Um, just a few reminders before we leave. Guests, please stop by the welcome table in the lobby. If you're online with us, um, please fill out that link so we can say hi to you this week. Um, our giving table is in the back on the way out if you're here in the Norwood room. And if there's anything you need prayer about today, maybe you need prayer about your inheritance in heaven, um, we have a prayer team in the back ready to pray for you. So let's pray before we leave. God, thank you for today. Keep us safe. Keep us um, close to you, Lord. And I just pray that we can see you everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Take someone out to lunch today. It's so great to see you guys.